Wednesday, April the 10th, 1912, in brilliant sunshine, although the day was cold, the unsinkable pride of the White Star Line left Southampton. She was commanded by Captain Smith, Commodore of the White Star Fleet, and this was to be his last appointment before retiring. A crowd had gathered on the pier to watch her leave her moorings. The Titanic was a new breed of luxury liner. The route for this maiden voyage took her to Cherbourg and Queenstown, where she took on emigrants bound for the New World. Among her passengers were many of the wealthy and influential, with, according to one calculation, combined assets of 120 million pounds. There was something about the Titanic. It was so very formal. It was so stiff. The atmosphere was stiff. The uh, coziness. Uh, well, you know, the kind of get-together feeling. It didn't exist. I always remember going up on the lift. A little boy said to me, You know, madam, it's quite an honor. I'm only 14 years old. I'm a lift boy. But we were sleeping six in a bunk. And uh, we were treated like as if we were in a third-class restaurant as regards the food. We were not allowed to go at any part of the ship except the, uh, the deck that we were allowed to go on. It. If you were rich, the decks provided a sumptuous way of life. The band played the gayest tunes and American ragtime dances, and in the splendor of the Café Parisien, the light melodies of the day. The dining rooms, state rooms, and common rooms were furnished in various periods and styles, so that English gentlemen might sit in rooms panelled and adorned like their own at home. And so that those extra good food inches could be counteracted, they even provided a splendidly equipped gymnasium. On Sunday evening, April the 14th, the night of the gala dinner, the band was playing, the millionaires were drinking at the bar, the Titanic was aglow with glittering lights. Then three rings on the bell gave the alarm from the crow's nest, and a shout down the telephone, ice ahead. The time was 11.40. There was a very slight bump, just a little jar, nothing at all. I went in my room, there was a second light jar, nothing of consequence. But you knew something had happened, and one man said, Look at that. That's an iceberg, and it's a whopper. Because you know, there's one-eighth above the water, and seven-eighths below. And this blooming thing's ahead, oh, all the way over the top of the ship thought nothing of it. We picked up the bits of ice and most of us played snowballs. Well, I found a life belt in one of the cabins, the first class cabins. I put this on, not so, not securely, and I was walking aimlessly on deck, thinking what to do next. And uh, looking over the side, I saw the boats being launched for the uh, survivors. And it was moving in children on the first so I had no chance there. And I was, while I was looking over the, the uh, side of the boat, one of the crew in the lifeboat shouted out to me to jump. Well, I didn't actually jump off the boat. I crawled across the derricks, came down the falls, dropped in the water, and I was picked up by the boat that, that returned to pick me up. A little while later, a man came to my door. His teeth were chattering. He said, Madam, Get up, get out. You know, they're making the women and children leave in lifeboats. They say you're coming back for breakfast. You know, these crazy English, they do anything. They make you get up and go off in boats and go off and come back for breakfast. What do you think of that? But before I went, I locked every window in my three staterooms and closed every trunk and locked every trunk and took the keys with me. Nineteen keys for nineteen trunks. I had all my evening slippers, diamond buckles. No, not real diamonds, but diamond. And I had a wool cap and two fox furs 
and a paper-thin broad-tailed coat and no underwear and no stockings but a pair of velvet slippers and these buckles and I lost a buckle and who should I see Mr. Mock a miniature painter and he said look it's trouble I just said no well he said you'll have to jump now into the lifeboat I said jump with this thing I've got on what do you think I am an acrobat or a monkey or something I can jump and this thing, what well, he said, you'll have to. My sister's in that lifeboat. Well, I looked at that lifeboat, swinging out on the davits. Oh, possibly, oh, I don't know by measurements, but it was an awful long way. And down below was the sea, 14 stories below. What well, if you jumped and you fell between? No, I never would have left the ship, but a sailor came along and he said, say you, you don't want to be saved. Well, I'll save your baby. And he grabbed this pig from under my arm and he tossed it in the lifeboat. And I turned to this man, Monk, and I said, that does it. But when they threw that pig, I knew it was my mother calling me. You know, when we look at the figures, there were less people saved from the steerage class That's right. than there were from the first right, class. Right, because they were not allowed to go on, on a first class deck. And that was the only way one could be saved? Yes. In the wireless cabin, the two operators, Phillips and Bride, flashed out signals for assistance until the deck was awash. Did the band actually play music while the ship went down? No. Yeah, I heard the band play when the boat struck when I first tried to get on the deck. But when I decided to jump off the boat, I actually saw the band standing about with the instruments. I don't doubt that they were playing music. Other people heard it. But when people say that music played as the ship went down, that is a ghastly, horrible lie. Arthur Lewis, the bedroom steward, was saved because he was detailed to row one of the lifeboats. What were the other passengers like in the lifeboat? Well, they never spoke, you see. There were women and children in the boat all night, but they never spoke. They just sat about, sat about down there waiting to get picked up. But you never talked to each other? No, well, we didn't know one another, so we couldn't get in conversation. And then, the horrible fear was in my heart, and I think everybody else's, that the dreadful, dreadful suction that had drawn us towards the Titanic would suck us under the Titanic. At 2.20 a.m. on Monday the 15th of April and two and a half hours after she struck the iceberg, the largest liner afloat slid beneath the black icy waters to the floor of the Atlantic. The Titanic carried a total of 2,206 passengers and crew. 703 people survived. The total loss of life was 1,503. The ill-fated Hindenburg on her last flight sails over New York. These pictures made from a Pathé news plane less than four hours before the tragedy show the world's largest airship heading for Lakehurst, New Jersey. Over Newark's famous auto skyway, the airship was hailed by thousands who little dreamed it was their final glimpse of the Hindenburg. Inside the silver envelope are 16 separate gas bags, each filled with hydrogen, a highly inflammable gas. From the ground, you can see the forward control cabin from which the ship is operated. The windows along the side indicate the location of the passengers quarters in which many were carried to a flaming death. Approaching Lakehurst, the Hindenburg appeared a conquering giant of the skies, 
but she proved a puny plaything in the mighty grip of fate. It almost seemed as if fate had set the stage for the horrible tragedy. A graceful craft sailing serenely to her doom. For three hours, the dirigible circled the landing field at Lakehurst, New Jersey, dumping more water ballast than ever before in vain efforts to level off. Again she dumps ballast, and a nervous tension grips those who are watching, for this is something unusual. There goes more ballast, but the tail is settling in spite of all that has been dumped. A grim note of impending tragedy. Finally, the landing lines are dropped. These scenes were filmed by Pathé News cameraman William Deke, and you are about to see the pictures he got when the ship exploded. Those aboard leaping for life from a flaming inferno, the actual crash of the Hindenburg, an airship destroyed in less than half a minute. Rushing to the rescue, the heroes of the tragedy dash in, heedless of danger to help the injured to safety, while others, beyond help, perish in the flames. The blazing aftermath reveals the extent of the disaster, an inferno which became a flaming tomb, a twisted mass of girders, the seared and scorched skeleton of what was once a mighty airship. Hindenburg has gone. She represented man's latest attempt to conquer the Atlantic by air. Her tragedy will not halt the march of progress. From her ashes will arise the knowledge, from her fate the lesson that will lead to a greater and a better means of mastering the air. If so, her dead will not have died in vain. Practically standing still now, they've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship and uh, it's been taken a hold up down on the field by a number of men. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it. It burst into flames. Wait, wait, get it started, get it started. It's right, and it's right, it's right, it's terrible. Oh my, get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning bath. And all the folks will see that this is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world. Still, oh, it's Feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mast. All the humanity and all the fans are screaming around it. I told you, I never talk to people and friends are on there. It, it, it's a, oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. 
Honest, it's just like that massive fucking wreckage. <laughs>